Hello, and welcome back to Talk About It, the official podcast series of Phenomenology Club. As you can see, I have been uploading with a bit more frequency than I have in the past month or so. Uh, Like I've said, I am balls deep in a lot of responsibilities and finishing up some projects, um, and that is still true, but... um, you know, trying to stay active and make sure that I keep uploading these so I don't lose any audience base or engagement that I may have acquired for myself because I have a bit of a habit of doing that, you know, getting really enthusiastic about a thing, doing the thing for a while, and then doing another thing so I could come back to the first thing later, you know, but that is part of what I'm trying to avoid and that's actually part of why I started uploading in this more stream of consciousness laissez-faire format at all um, because previously you know these were all video essays but recently I've been feeling as if I do want to transition a little bit back into sort of a more formal format. I've been uploading these on Spotify as season number zero because they have some option to do that. Uh, with the idea that eventually I will return back to something that I think is a little more thought out and formal. That is what I desire to do anyway. But I've also heard from some of you wonderful people that you actually really appreciate the more informal tone of this series. So if that's something you have feelings about, please share them with me because I want to know what my listeners Ugh, that sounds so vain. My listeners. You're my listeners. But anybody who enjoys this series, I want to know what you enjoy about it and if you would appreciate or maybe not appreciate uh, something else, something more, something less. I don't know. I, for one, have been feeling like these are a bit too long. I'm just tired of hearing myself speak. I feel like everything I say a lot of times is sort of obvious. And for the past few episodes, too... I feel like they've been a reflection of my general state of thinking recently, which is characterized by having much more questions than answers for myself, which is kind of exciting, although frustrating, you know. I feel like I come into plateaus with my thinking where I feel as if I've reached some groundbreaking revelation, you know, internally. Um... And then I feel high off of the euphoria of such realizations and then going through all of my other personally held worldview key points and altering them to fit within this groundbreaking revelation I've had. But recently I feel in all of the various topics I've been thinking about as if I'm feeling much less satisfying concluding thoughts and more questions than ever so I apologize too if (laughs) you feel as if I've just been meandering as I (laughs) question aloud all of these uh things that have (laughs) I've been thinking about without offering any sort of fun hot takes or conclusions about them this is definitely going to be following in that direction because ever since the eugenics upload I did two uploads ago which really (laughs) was also a bit of the same thing I have just been thinking so much so much about healthcare and medicine and what sort of problems and potential things we need to do or things we need to do to reach potential solutions might be required of us especially as it relates to things like government and the role of government in medicine and things like reproduction and all of this um i'm also doing this upload today because i've been invigorated and feel enthusiastic to announce that as of yesterday this channel is officially monetized on youtube (laughs) so yes I've sold out I'm a fucking corporate shill now you have to watch stupid fucking ads before these videos unless you have ad blocker which I do um (laughs) it's funny actually I went to uh I clicked the episode that I did the other day on feminism toxic femininity for international women's day 
and the ad that played was some like feminist comedian series uh and they were like feminism is about equality like so listen to our show or something and I just thought that was kind of hilarious because that's like totally the opposite of my beliefs about feminism um so that's funny uh, and made me feel less like a sellout because even though I now have corporate advertising on my YouTube videos, clearly, clearly, they don't know what I'm about. I'm subverting the message. Um, also, uh, now that YouTube has enabled monetization, you can now donate live with these super chats, which I hope that you do because, bitch, I am broke. I am broke. And you know why I'm broke? Because I don't give a fuck about money. Money does not motivate me. I'm a very hardworking individual. Okay. I do shit all day long. But my problem is I don't care about how I can capitalize off of all of my never-ending efforts doing shit. <laughs> it's very hard to care until I have $5 in the bank. And tobacco costs seven dollars, and then I care. But as soon as I get those two more dollars and get my tobacco, I don't give a fuck anymore. This is my problem. I'm not, I'm not motivated by systems of capital. Quite the opposite. I find that they're repulsive to me. Um, but also, like I said, anybody who doesn't know, uh, we're on Spotify, which we're able to do because uh, I upload through that um service anchor anchor fm by the way if any of you are artists or people that want to start your own podcast i don't want to uh you know be a corporate shill but i have to say uh i like anchor because they're free and i believe that they're spotify's company so uh whenever i do these i'm able to upload to spotify within like an hour and a half usually after doing these on youtube um so that's pretty cool to have your shit on Spotify because, you know, I don't I don't know much about the podcasting world. I'm trying to I'm not trying to, but I've been getting more into it, trying to find some podcasts that I like and shit. And it seems like a lot of them are on Spotify. So if you're trying to get your shit on Spotify, I can definitely recommend Anchor. And Anchor also has other features. If you go to the Phenomenology Club Anchor page, there's also an option to donate. If any of you feel like throwing cash at a broke-ass bitch, please go ahead. And they also um, have links for like all of these other podcast platforms that they upload to. I've never heard of really any of them, except I think Apple Podcasts is one of them. I don't even know what the fuck Apple Podcasts is, but it's a thing. I know some of you say you listen to podcasts on apple Podcasts. so if you ever need links to every platform that this series is uploaded to it's anchor.com slash phenomenology club it might be phenomenology dash club i don't know google it uh and we're also called phenomenology club on spotify oh and of course you can always support via the patreon which i link in all of these it's only one dollar to be a member where you gain full access to our discord chats um, but also, uh, in the realm of feeling like a sellout, I know that, <laughs> uh, some of the past few uploads I've done are a little more political in nature. Like I've said before, I can't stand people who are just like, this is my opinion, and they're not an expert in anything. This is part of my insecurity and why I want to try to shift a little bit back more to a formal sort of approach to these episodes where hopefully I can tell you something you don't know not just give you my fucking opinions which really I mean I'm not an expert in anything I have a degree in film I guess I could just talk about film if you ever need to concede to my authority concede to my authority about film <laughs> and nothing else um but the feminist upload I did the other day got more views than I usually do in the first 24 hours. I don't think it's even been up 24 hours. But, you know, it got notably more views than I usually get in the in the beginning hours of uploading. Which kind of makes me a little bit sad, have to say. Have to air out my insecurities a bit. I feel like a little uh, sad about that. Because, you know, why is that? Why is that? Is it just because feminism is such a hot topic right now? Or is it also because, you know, I'm a woman and um, 
I'm always dropping some fucking feminist bullshit on like social media or something and people just want to uh, be here for the controversy or something. I don't know. But I hope that you can also listen to my other more mundane, less inflammatory topics because, you know, part of what I like to do too is take topics that are not normally inflammatory and make them inflammatory. I mean, any of you who are in the Phenomenology Club Discord know that we get pretty riled up in there about a variety of topics, many of which I would say most people have never felt any sort of pangs of emotion while discussing. We've had people leave because they were so upset during a discussion about art or painting, <laughs> which I just find to be awesome. But anyway, like I said, let's let's get this started. Sorry. Oh my God, 10 minutes. I've been rambling. God damn it. So sorry. Like I said, um, talking about some of the things we talked about the other day in the eugenics upload really has just got me thinking so hard. Uh, and my brain hurts. It really hurts. And I'm going to try my hardest to make your brain hurt too in a fun way, you know, because this is the fun of philosophy and of critical thinking in general. It's almost like a puzzle, you know, it's up to us to map it all out in a way that is coherent and consistent and accounts for all different types of hypothetical scenarios so we can feel satisfied moving forward with a game plan essentially but like I said in that upload and um, something that I've just really been meditating on I feel as if medicine perhaps more than really any other institution uh, in modern society has completely transformed our moral landscape in a way that becomes really, really confusing. Um, I think that especially as it relates to matters of things like reproduction and reproductive health, which is something we talked about in that episode, uh, I feel like whereas before nature kind of took care of a lot of these moral questions for us you know questions about things like survivability of certain vulnerable populations and such now this is becoming less true with the advent of really complex medical technologies you know and now we are tasked with this incredible burden of making our own decisions uh, in the face of the reality that we now harness all of these incredibly complex technologies that allow us to do things like prolong the life of this or that person or hypothetically optimize their health in this or that regards, you know. And I think that it's especially difficult because a lot of these sorts of questions that are arising sort of seem to fly in the face of what seems natural and what seems evolutionary. And this is why it was so easy, I think, before to just let nature take care of all of these things, you know. We weren't really, we didn't really have much accountability in any of these processes, you know. But this is sort of the problem, I think, of organizing society and coming up with systems of morality and ethics and politics in general, right? Because on the one hand, our systems of morality seem very much motivated by natural forces, you know? Morality, as I've said many times before on this channel, specifically in my moral relativism in the arts upload, um, I think morality is very motivated by underlying natural phenomena, forces of nature, you know, things like empathy, you know, we can rationalize empathy and empathy does become a rational process in many ways, but also it's undeniably true that a force like empathy is also physiological, you know, and we venerate it because we have come up with systems of rational thought that really uphold the utility and the goodness, so to speak, of a thing like empathy, but without that underlying impulse, the physiological impulse towards empathy itself, I doubt such a thing would exist in our society, you know, we didn't create empathy really. We uphold and venerate empathy and create logical arguments around the phenomena of our experience of empathy, but at baseline, it is very natural. And I think that things like this are what underlie all of the systems of morality and ethics that we have come up with, you know. But 
obviously, as technology goes further and further towards whatever the fuck it's going towards, these things become so much more complex and nuanced and difficult to really reach decisions on because it all becomes so quote unquote unnatural and we don't, we sort of lose whatever guideline we think we have that lies in nature itself that we can look to to sort of motivate our decisions as we try to come up with the most rational or the best outcomes in all of these matters you know I spoke about IVF in the last in the eugenics episode and how I feel as if IVF itself presents as a very unethical practice for one because of the presence of all of these children in society that have no parents and also you know the fact that many of them are put into foster care where we all know foster care is a system that is so fucking uh grossly managed by our government our government does not care about these children many of them are abused um in very serious ways not taken care of i mean children really don't have rights in our society at all which is so fucked up and something we should talk about one day um but i think that even though much of society you know the task of creating a society and a an organized society has much to do with mediating and doing things that present as unnatural I think that medicine is perhaps the most difficult one because medicine more than anything else really only speaks to what is natural you know the science of our very biology you know uh, and all of the sort of ethical questions and concerns that arise from the institution of medicine have to do so explicitly with natural processes that trying to devise systems of morality that are coherent and logically consistent I think just becomes incredibly 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 difficult especially as like I said you know this becomes more and more complex really by the day um I sort of ended the last episode the the eugenics one with a question um that I'm going to pose again to you right now I think we should start off with it right now Um, I was speaking about how it seems very strange and like a problem that in our current moral landscape, uh, specifically as it relates to matters of reproduction and reproductive health, it seems wrong that a few things can be simultaneously true, can be simultaneously true. And what I was talking about was... um, this this example this specific example of aborting a pregnancy terminate terminating a pregnancy because of an illness it seems that most of us in our modern society uh at least maybe (laughs) those of us who are on one of one political leaning anyway can all sympathize with the idea that it is morally not offensive and perhaps even righteous to do a thing like terminate a pregnancy because of an illness right this seems to be well accepted by many of us but at the same time we also seem to accept that it is also not morally wrong and perhaps it is morally righteous to carry a pregnancy to full term despite an illness you know and I have a hard time thinking about how these things can be simultaneously true is it both moral to terminate a pregnancy because of an illness and also to choose to abstain from terminating a pregnancy despite an illness do you, what do you guys think let's let's get some discussion in the chat do you think that these things can be simultaneously true and if so why because i don't think that this can be true or if it can be true it has to be true for a very specific reason that if i terminate a pregnancy because of an illness that this is the morally right thing to do it cannot also be true then that people who carry out a pregnancy with the same illness can also be morally right there there is there a right or a wrong thing to do in a scenario like this what do you guys think because also in thinking about this 
I then think, okay, well, what about the question of carrying a pregnancy to term because of an illness, you know? What if you want to reproduce and make an offspring that resembles you? Let's say you are someone with some sort of serious medical ailment or genetic disability, so to speak. I don't know, genetic illness. What if you decide that you want to reproduce specifically for this purpose, you know? I want to create an offspring that has the same exact genetic composition as myself because you know I could have all types of reasons and I've seen this actually put forward by people I'm thinking of a specific example that I won't I won't bring up the person or the thing because you know fuck all that it doesn't matter but the idea that okay perhaps I can rationalize my genetic uh, disability or my my medical illness made me a stronger individual and because of this I want to have a child that is exactly like me and even though I know they will suffer I think that ultimately this thing that society calls a disability is actually a gift you know because it was a gift to me it made me a stronger individual and I would like my offspring to go through the same exact set of con- of circumstances because I believe that it will also better them. What about this, you know? M says, if you are financially and emotionally ready to care for a sick child, then it can be morally right. Sick children do not get adopted, so carrying it to term just to put it up for adoption is incredibly immoral. Okay, M, so following from that statement then, what about carrying a child to term that does not have an illness, you know, that you know will get adopted? Is it is it only immoral because you think that this child will not become adopted or something? What is ultimately the thing that the entire moral argument is contingent on? Is it the suffering of the individual? Because something like that, I think, would not even be answered by what you just said, you know. What are we really trying to avoid or or uphold? What is our entire moral argument contingent on here, you know? Because you're saying that that the thing in question and the thing that ultimately will determine whether or not it's a moral action to carry out this or that pregnancy, maybe as a relates to having sick offspring has to do with how well they will be cared for um but what about the question of suffering you know does that play into the argument at all you know could somebody argue that it is immoral to consciously carry to term a sick child because you know that they will suffer greatly How much do you think that this impacts the potential arguments for whether or not this is a moral action? (laughs) Noam Chomsky is here. Wow. Hey, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky says, with or without a specific illness, everyone will suffer. By having children, we are guaranteeing them to suffer. (laughs) Perhaps, um, but... In the realm of illness, okay, because sure, you can say that we all suffer. It is part of the human condition, undoubtedly. But the knowledge that certain beings will suffer more in a purely physical, which leads to more psychological distress, obviously, but knowing that somebody will suffer from a very um, debilitating physical sort of handicap or illness what about this I mean does it become irrelevant Noam Chomsky ultimately because as you say everybody will suffer you know um I think that the problem well obviously the problem is really complex and nuanced and I think that if we want to try to parse through the problem we need to identify what the underlying moral issue is because already we can see that there's all sorts of different variables that will ultimately affect 
the solution, you know, or our, our answer and whether or not we think that it's ethical to do X or Y thing, you know, is what we are trying to do with medicine, period, um, to avoid suffering or is it perhaps to optimize health? And what does optimize health even mean? Because avoiding suffering can be a part of this, right? Or is it perhaps that we are trying to prolong life, you know? What is the very role of medicine? And clearly, it can supersede its role, you know? And how are we supposed to regulate all of these things when it comes to a thing like government, which, you know, is a key player, obviously, in all of these discussions now more than ever? Um, because... You know, I'm somebody who very much believes that the role of government and organized society is basically to protect the individual. You know, I'm definitely a, a social contract theorist, I guess you could call me. I believe very much that government should be something that is seen and approached by the individual as contractual. You know, I willfully enter myself into a binding agreement with a group of people, which is all of you or all of you who live here with me in New Jersey, you know, with the understanding that I will do some sort of part or shared responsibility as if this was some sort of club and in return be offered protection, you know, from all of you motherfuckers, from the elements you know we expect government to try to help in times of need especially you know national uh, natural disasters and stuff um and then also now medicine and this is something that is so new you know uh and something that is such a topic of debate in the united states where i reside especially you know because now healthcare. um is a thing that seems to resemble something we should all be entitled to, you know. Whereas not that long ago, medicine was not even so advanced enough that it could help most of us survive the common cold in such a short period of time. Now we have just completely gone in some direction where we're talking about crazy medical procedures on the horizon you know that might soon be possible things that a hundred years ago no one would have even thought about you know a hundred years ago the entire institution of medicine itself might have been mentally approached by your average individual the way that we approach things like holistic healing you know it's like well maybe it can help but I don't know everybody in my town fucking died from the common cold last month last winter so, you know, I hope the doctor can help me, but I don't have incredibly high hopes, you know. Now we have much more confidence in medicine. The standard of care has risen in such a dramatic way um, and maybe in a way that I think is rising exponentially faster than how we're even able to comprehend it, you know. And um, I think that this is really a problem and a problem that we're going to be tasked with challenging and confronting very, very soon, you know. I think we're already tasked with it, you know, um, because we have to come up with what we think the purpose of healthcare is itself and what is the morality of medicine, the ethics of medicine itself, and how does this relate to government, you know? Because these are entirely different questions, too, you know? Um, one of the key tenets of medical ethics is a consideration for a thing like bodily autonomy, you know? How much does bodily autonomy play into our logical arguments for why or why not we should have the right to do or to abstain from this or that thing and how much does the government have the right to do this or that because we speak a lot about things like bodily autonomy when it comes to things like abortion for example um you know and i think that bodily autonomy is something that i personally uh you know care about and promote but in thinking about it further 
I don't think that bodily autonomy or some philosophical argument for bodily autonomy is actually sufficient or a good thing necessarily to argue for in the face of government or if it is we it, it it's not go it's not consistent because to think about bodily autonomy right if we all have the right to bodily autonomy then what can be the uh the conflict why does it seem that many of the people who argue for bodily autonomy when it comes to matters of abortion are super against um things like the anti-vaxxers you know uh, people who are against anti or people who are against vaccination, um, I think that they do have some compelling arguments. I think that the general public has sort of tried to paint them as a bunch of crazy women, really, because I think a lot of the anti vaccine sentiment in general is very misogynistic. Okay, let me just throw that out there. Of course, there are absolutely crazies in the movement. I'm not trying to say that they don't exist because they do. But the general public's uh, painting of this group of people, like they're all a bunch of crazy people that think vaccines cause autism and they're so scared of autism and this or that, I mean, that is really just not really reflective of the reality. And if you look into what some of these anti-vaccination people are saying, I think that a lot of them raise compelling arguments. And also a lot of them, I think, really do have children that suffered negative side effects from vaccines because you know the cdc doesn't even deny the fact that certain vaccines have resulted in uh, very serious neurological consequences and side effects um, this is reported by them it's not like this is an impossible outcome from any of these vaccines it has been proven and the cdc admits that certain vaccines can result uh, in in severe neurological side effects and i believe that some of these mothers that uh, and fathers but it is true that mothers are definitely spearheading this movement but it is true I think that certain mothers do have children that are, are, are some of these people you know they had children that uh, suffered a serious neurological consequence of this vaccination you know so I, I do empathize more with anti-vaxxers than I think the general public really would would be satisfied with me doing but I also think that it raises a lot of ethical questions, you know, because if it's true, then if we know it's true, uh, because the CDC doesn't even deny it, that vaccines can have serious, serious consequences, even as far as permanently neurologically impairing you, then do we want the government to have the right to force us to vaccinate? You know, do, do we want to give this right to the government? And if we do, in what capacity? Because at the same time, you look at the other side of the argument, which I think the general public mostly aligns with, which I think is an equally compelling argument, which is that, well, Part of the role of government is to ensure my bodily safety and reduce any potential harm that comes to me, right? So if we have the technology, if we have the medicine to give vaccines, while it's true that there'll be an unfortunate percentage of people that suffer negative consequences, ultimately the good is for the group, you know, and it's better than the other potential outcome where we all just have fucking polio and whatever, you know, and it's not fair that certain people will just not take the risk upon themselves to vaccinate and we all have to be exposed to them and potentially to whatever kind of illness they can be harboring within themselves you know and questions like this i think are very relevant too i mean amidst what we're going through right now with the coronavirus you know what is the role of government we're already expressing dissatisfaction with the way some of our hospitals are being run and what the government is doing about this or that. Should we impose travel restrictions? Is that overstepping their boundaries? You know, a thing like quarantine seems like it could be something that is a uh, that could potentially happen somewhere what is the legality of that what's the ethics of that making this or that person stay home get vaccinated get treatment if they don't want to things like this you know bodily autonomy clearly i think cannot be the be all to end all justification for any sort of philosophical argument in the realm of medicine and medicinal ethics you know but it clearly is a very important variable so i think that we have to figure out how important it is and to what extent 
God, I'm just talking. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to read something from the Hippocratic Oath really quick. This is the oath that doctors still uh, swear on, though I'm sure they've modified some of the text because it's interesting. Some of the stuff they have in here clearly reflects uh, a certain, uh, some certain ethical uh, opinions that I think, well, I know that doctors in our modern society don't necessarily share, but I thought this was interesting reading it. This is from the 5th century, before Christ, before Jesus. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read a little bit of the text. It, it's still very short if you want to read the whole thing, but uh, I wanted to read one thing. Where is it? Where is it? Okay, this is the third, uh, I'm not sure actually, this might not be from the full text, but this is a little clause from the Hippocratic Oath, 5th century, before Jebus. I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. Similarly, I will not give to a woman a pessary to cause abortion, but I will keep pure and holy both my life and my art. I will not use the knife, not even verily on sufferers from stone, but I will give place to such as are craftsmen therein. I found this super interesting because just from this text, you know, you could see that they're already grappling uh with with these sorts of questions that we're grappling with right now um because you know i think they immediately present as obvious in all matters of medicine you know they say that they'll not administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so which i find to be really interesting um especially now when we're starting to talk about the ethics of euthanasia if somebody is suffering you know should they be allowed to use medicine to end their suffering you know should it be legal something like this um i also thought it was interesting that they mention abortion even though obviously i am pro abortion uh, I do actually kind of admire the fact that they included it at all because I find that in a lot of discussions about healthcare and stuff, some of the most seminal texts of philosophy of medicine and a lot of this stuff, I feel like they kind of omit women entirely. Uh, and this is part of why, you know, in America or in the United States, we uh, see that women really don't even have the right to abortion. And this is why it can be taken from us at any moment without this explicit right to abortion, you know, uh, we're not, we, we have no reason to feel secure that tomorrow they won't just take it away from us. Right now we're only covered under an umbrella, right? Which is the right to medical privacy, you know, but what the fuck does that even mean? It's sort of a vague concept and can be interpreted in so many ways, just like the concept of a thing like suffering can be interpreted in so many ways, you know? Um, and they also mention that here, um, that they'll not use the knife on sufferers from stone. I'm not even sure what this means, honestly. But unless I'm misinterpreting this, I think that um, I think that what is being stated here essentially is that doctors are taking an oath to do the most minimal amount of effort required to preserve somebody's life or livelihood you know the whole thing with the Hippocratic Oath that we're all familiar with is to is do no harm you know I feel like the general philosophy of this text is almost to take the most minimal approach necessary to medicine period and that's really interesting because I think this very question is exactly what's causing us so much mental dissonance in our modern society because ultimately health care especially as we conceptualize it more and more as it uh, being potentially a right of individuals a right that should be enforced and insured by our government itself um the standard of 
the standard for healthcare is always set by the standard of care available, period. You know, like I was saying not long ago, uh, you couldn't even really feel confidently that medicine might help you survive the common cold during fucking winter over there in the prairies or whatever. But now that this isn't true, you know, now that medicine can do things like like increase the likelihood you will survive from cancer by you know like 80 percent depending on the kind of cancer now that these sorts of technologies exist and we can place so much more confidence in the outcomes of these sorts of medicinal therapies everything is so greatly altered you know um i feel like this is going to continue to change you know uh I brought up that show Unnatural Selection when I was talking about the eugenics uh, stuff. If you guys saw that show, you saw that they brought out these two rats that they did stem cell uh, therapies on. And these two rats were born on the same exact day. And one of them, who had no stem cell therapy, uh, looked like it was in its final stages of life. It was like a grandpa rat. Like, it had fucking wrinkles. You could tell this rat was old just by looking at it. And then they bring out its fucking brother rat, who was born on the same exact day that they've done stem cell therapy therapy on and it looked like a fucking teenager i mean they're literally uh prolonging the life and not only the life but even the the outward and internal health of this biological being by i think it was two-thirds you know just by doing this new therapy i mean what if that kind of technology becomes available to humans which i i see no reason to think that it won't in the very near future you know if we could prolong our life by two-thirds you know uh what would then be the ethical implications of this thing you know because clearly especially as depression is so fashionable right now you ask people do you want to live uh 66 percent longer a lot of people will of course answer no get me out of here i hate it here (laughs) whatever you know but many of us myself included will be like fuck yes i do sign me up shoot me up with that shit i want to live forever you know will this be an elective procedure uh what if what if we find out that the way to have the most effective outcomes is to implement this kind of therapy while the uh, person is still in utero you know what if we find out that the only way to use such a therapy is by using it um uh, in the womb you know then what because when it's an elective procedure when I give you the option do you want to stay alive for 66 percent longer than you normally would you know it's easy to say well whoever wants to can and whoever doesn't doesn't have to but what if this is only possible if you implement it in the womb you know then what do we do we give it to everybody so you have no choice in the matter you know what are the sorts of ethical variables that change this kind of question it's all so fucking treacherous uh sorry i just keep going um let me let me look at the chat real quick hmm Hmm, 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 hmm. SS zone. the government should enforce vaccinations, but if the person who chose not to get vaccinated should have to pay without insurance to get treated? Hmm. Well, the problem, SS Retro, is not as simple as, you know, if somebody chooses not to get vaccinated, And then they fall ill because of whatever disease would have been preventable if they had only gotten vaccinated. The problem is not really that, oh, well, now we all have to pay for their therapy or something. I mean, we don't in America because we don't have public health care, unfortunately. But I think the real ethical question is, uh, you know, should we all have to be exposed to this high risk person Who could very well carry, you know, uh, this disease or something, Um, you know, uh, because maybe I wasn't vaccinated for this or that thing. I mean, well, that is interesting, actually, because I didn't really think about that, you know, Um, 
the main ethical problem that people raise when we talk about things like vaccination and anti-vaxxers is the possibility of exposing vulnerable people to sickness um, and children that really don't have much of a choice in the matter. But, you know, I guess it stands to reason if we're all vaccinated and we have nothing to worry about, if I choose to take that risk on myself, you know, then what does it really matter? You know, the worst thing that could happen, right, would be that maybe this child will fall ill, you know. Um, so really, I think the main ethical question, I, I guess, would have to do with the child itself. You know, how much how much should uh, responsibility should be allotted to the parent, you know, because I think that this is a whole other ethical can of worms and something I'm not going to get into right now. But um, children have basically no autonomy, you know, parents have way too much say in what a child can or cannot do. Um, and I think that that's really fucked up. Um, reading the chat. <laughs> prolonging life is cool and all but then our sustainability efforts need to develop just as quickly which i don't see happening and honestly as a society we need to start changing our views on adoption now there's already too many children without homes longer lifespans is more time to procreate um i agree M. um you know I shared some of my thoughts on this in the last uh, episode or whatever. But, you know, in thinking about all of these things, too, I, I think that, you know, it's very, very philosophically treacherous because I don't think that the solution then would be to, if we all agreed, you know, people should stop procreating until we at least can get all these uh, parentless children in homes taken care of, fix our foster care system, you know, um, all of this kind of thing, you know, uh, we should all stop procreating. How do we enforce such a thing? And this brings us back to the question of what is the role of government, you know, because I don't feel comfortable giving government such a right, you know, to do a thing like enforce, uh, enforce some sort of limit on how many children people can have. Because we know for a fact the government will absolutely abuse this authority, you know. They'll target certain demographics that they already have it out for and try to make it more difficult for this or that racial demographic to reproduce, you know. They'll make it easier for the more affluent, wealthier people to reproduce, which is already a thing that exists, you know. It seems to me like the system of ethics in our medicine medicinal institutions and the system of ethics in our political institutions, I think ultimately cannot totally inform one or the other and if i had to try to strategize towards some sort of potential solutions for any of this shit you know i think that this is one of the first things i would do you know for one like i said i think we need to really come up with a philosophically comprehensive argument for what exactly the role of medicine should be period should it be a thing that above all promotes bodily autonomy should it be a thing that exists to reduce suffering and in that sense promote livelihood should it be a thing that if it promotes livelihood also be a thing that will necessarily favor something like the prolonging of life because you know obviously we do this already to think I mean, I gave the example of the rat and this hypothetical example of, you know, maybe soon we'll be able to prolong our own lifespans by 66%, you know, just from new stem cell therapies. Uh, and that's an extreme example. But we already do this, don't we, when people are dying on the street and we revive them, you know. I don't think people have many moral hangups about this kind of thing. But we're really doing a thing that I think at its core the mechanism of is exactly the same you know we are prolonging your life because we have the technology to do so you would otherwise die but because we have this technology we are going to intervene and revive you you know to take you to the hospital I don't think most people like think this is a uh, uh, something that is morally questionable in and of itself and in fact you know some of the laws we have around these sorts of things are uh, really interesting from a philosophical perspective as well and hard to think about you know uh, 
there's certain states that have tried to implement things like laws that make you responsible if you see somebody who is in need of medical care and do not do anything. You know, um, this is another thing that I think presents as sort of obvious to most people. Like, of course, you should legally penalize them if they don't intervene or do this or that thing. But it also becomes easy to see how this uh, can be very problematic, you know, because what if what if I see someone in the street and I don't realize that they're dying? You know, I think that they're playing a joke or filming a movie or something it sounds absurd but when you consider how many people die from accidents every fucking day and all this random shit and think about every sort of weird experience you've ever encountered maybe quickly and not done anything about because you didn't even have time to react and maybe it was on the side of the highway and you're already gone like what was that you know now do you you could be legally responsible and face something like a manslaughter charge for not interacting it becomes kind of easy to see maybe why we try to be more moderate with the sorts of laws that we establish here you know um but what I was just saying is, you know, it's interesting because as somebody who definitely believes uh, in in something like how I think we do need universal health care and I very much believe we should have it. I also think in thinking about all of this that perhaps what needs to happen too, like I was just saying, is really something that almost resembles a separation of church and state except instead of church it's medicine and state you know well at the same time maybe implementing some sort of laws that speak for this unique relationship just like we kind of have the right to religious freedom in the united states while also trying to maintain this sort of separation you know um i personally think religious freedom is like the dumbest right ever don't give a fuck i wish that we had never implemented it here because at this point I feel like we almost rely on it in a way where it has become necessary where it shouldn't have become necessary ever the only good things that I think religious freedom laws have ever sort of helped in the United States is you know offering some sort of protections for groups that are marginalized and targeted for I would say uh violent or harmful behaviors motivated by racism and really not motivated by a thing like religious hatred you know I mean people don't hate Muslims because they just hate Islam people in America hate Muslims because they're fucking racist I mean same goes for the Jews they don't just hate Jewish they don't just hate the fucking Talmud and the Torah or whatever they fucking are racist you know but at this point it becomes almost these laws are kind of useful and we need them but we should just get rid of them and get some real fucking actual hate crime laws in effect. But I digress. I think that medicine, clearly the goal of medicine and what it what should be required of it in our systems of ethics that we come up with to govern how medicine itself is practiced will not look exactly the same for what we assign to our political legislation as it relates to medicine you know I think that these things will look very different although similar but you know language and the structuring of these arguments is really essential to everything all of this is so so treacherous it feels like we're walking a fucking tightrope you know so goddamn 53 minutes I feel like I didn't even breathe this whole time I'm sorry I hope you found this interesting um, I'm gonna get out of here. Like I said, sorry to just unload so many questions on you, but this is exactly where I'm at in my thinking. And I've started making charts because I don't know about you guys, but this is how I have fun delineating and trying to find out, you know, uh, what I think is or is not logical or rationally sound when it comes to any philosophical puzzle you know I'm a big fan of this website called draw.io I believe that's what it's called um, where you can make custom charts they even have a desktop version you could download I just really like the interface and I love using it for these sorts of things you know like the chart I started making you know I'm trying to figure out exactly why healthcare. <laughs> what what is the goal of medicine what should it be you know uh and for what reasons, to what extent, it's all fucking math, you know, logic is math, math is logic, everything is, everything be like, 
Bruh. Um, thank you for listening. Like I said, if you missed the beginning of this upload, all of these are on Spotify. If you would rather listen there, please go subscribe to the Phenomenology Club Spotify. Um, please consider donating if you love me, either on Patreon or at anchor.fm slash phenomenology club or live in these chats because now we have the super chat. Um, yeah. Uh, let me know some of your thoughts. I would love if some of you could leave some comments as well. I know most of you who interact do so in the live chat, but always feel free too to come back and drop some drop some thoughts. I don't think this will be the last we hear of uh, the topic of medicine because as you can see, I'm balls deep in trying to figure out what I think myself. So if next time I have a light bulb go on in my head I will return and share any revolutions I have with you my human peers and I hope that you'll do the same for us if you have any groundbreaking revelations please please share them it is morally incumbent on you to do so thank you so much for listening and I'll talk to you all later good night